Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the corporate scrutiny for the 9th of October 2024. Uh, just to remind everybody, as normal, this uh, meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. We do have some apologies for tonight. Uh, we have um, apologies from Councillor Thomas J, Councillor Ken Norkey, uh, Councillor Andrew Wells, and we have a semi-apology for uh, Councillor Gareth Coates, who ha will have to leave um, a little bit early tonight um, for his next appointment. Uh, moving on. Um, we don't have any other apologies, just to confirm. I don't think we do. No? Okay. Declarations of interest for agenda item two. Does anybody have a declaration of interest that they wish to speak up for? Councillor Hadley. I do. Um, it's item number seven. Do you mind confirming the interest? Yeah, I'm a leaseholder. Thank you for that declaration. Anybody else? No? Okay. Agenda item three is an update from the chair. I don't have any updates specific other than what's uh, already in the agenda tonight. Agenda item four, responses to reports of the Corporate Scrutiny Committee. We have none at this time. Agenda item five, considerations of matters referred to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet to Council. And again, we don't have any. So moving on to our main agenda items. Uh, just to let you know for these um, reports, um, these are the reports that of course will be at Cabinet tomorrow and thus the report is formatted in the style of, of what would be for Cabinet essentially. Um, they do come with their recommendations that will be recommendations for Cabinet, although we can of course uh, you know, scrutinise them as we would in the normal way and potentially offer recommendations um, based on, on the content. So uh, for agenda item six, we have the social housing uh, regulatory programme update. Um, so if that's okay, can I go straight to um, the assistant director is, is, or the portfolio holder? Yep, of course, Ben Clark. How Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll just be very quick on my part. I just wanted to say that this is a, it's a very big and very important piece of work, and I'd like to um, pass my thanks over to Tina for all of her hard work on it. Um, I'm going to take the report as read as well, um, but we're, we're not where we want to be at the moment, but I think that the steps that we're taking have us well on the way to being where we want to be, um, and that is a service that puts tenants, leaseholders, customers at the heart of everything we do. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to hand over to Tina. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, so you have had an opportunity to look through the report um, and it is intended, as the Chair said, for Cabinet tomorrow. So of course you can make uh, any emerging observations or recommendations also to Cabinet. But it seeks to do um, four things really. It updates you and Cabinet formally on the self-referral that the Council's made in relation to the regulator, regulatory social housing consumer standards and there's a copy of the letter in the pack that we sent to the regulator um, on the 12th of August together with the areas that we were self-referring on. Um, it also asks Cabinet to approve a tenant and an impact assessment um, around managing risk while we rectify those matters, particularly around asset compliance and health and safety. Um, the fourth thing is it acknowledges the discussions which took, which took place at the Homelessness and Housing Advisory Board on the 1st of October around progress in the Autumn Road Show, which, as the portfolio holder has said, is designed to put tenants at the heart of that, along with leaseholders, to consult on service improvements um, that are clearly necessary across the housing service. Uh, and then finally, it asks you to comment and Cabinet to authorise um, an independent tenant advocate that will strengthen that tenant voice as part of the Homelessness and Housing Advisory Board that we're looking to refresh uh, in terms of its terms of reference. So the report does go into detail in terms of where we're non-compliant, but all I want to say in relation to that is this was as a result of um, 
uh, internal organisational grip around these issues and intelligence. It was not because of any incident or complaint about us and it was in the interests of transparency and it was about focusing on service improvement. So um, we've continued to have very positive discussions and dialogue with the regulator and as the report describes there are three routes to possible intervention, either no further action which is unlikely, um, an automatic consumer grading rated three, which shows significant improvement, or we can be in that middle route around regulatory intelligence, but we are planning uh, for a C3 rating and our communications plan is around that. So we see this as a journey to compliance and a real opportunity to um, you know, make sure that working with tenants and leaseholders, we strive to offer um, an excellent housing service. So happy to take questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for that, and uh, thank you for the report. Um, it's well written. Um, I do like actually the fact um, that we have some um, links, I suppose, to the sources um, in the report, which is which is really really useful, and actually would be great to see that uh, in other reports uh, from the council as well. Um, so I appreciate that. I think it's. Um, it's a difficult one in terms of self-referral. -refer um, it's um, quite frankly quite a courageous thing to do really. Uh, I think it was very necessary so I do support um, that, uh, that direction. Um, got, I have got some questions but does anybody from the committee want to come in with any questions of their own to kick this off? Can I wait till I've heard your questions and decide? <laughs> of course. <laughs> So um, I think the obvious one in the report is, is the glaring breach, and sorry to be sort of negative, I suppose. Um, and of course, this does come under um, uh, the uh, page, sorry, 3.5 of what I can see as page four. Uh, we do have a breach um, on the electrical inspections, um, and that number is 1,000. 386 um, and um, doesn't fall directly under the um, responsibility of the uh, uh, assistant director for Nate. Um, but I do think that's uh, quite a, a shocking figure actually and I just wondered if um, a director would like to expand further on, on how it arrived to that. Yep, yeah, so I'm happy to have a look at that. Uh, in terms of the electrical inspection, so I think the first thing to say is they are not a uh, regulatory requirement in terms of carrying that, those out. It is more around um, good practice that the regulator have come to look at, and there's other examples there of organisations who are in a similar position. Um, so notwithstanding the fact that there will be an opportunity to undertake a root and branch review around why we got to this position, um, the immediate action has been to stabilise that situation and obviously rectify that. So um, already I can say that we have engaged external expertise. We've already awarded a um, contract through a framework um, and we should be starting on site next week with uh, a planned project plan to bring all those electrical inspections up to date by March, notwithstanding no access and the options around mopping things up. So um, I think in terms of where, it, where why we've arrived at that, that information and intelligence will come later. But in terms of identifying that, the programme was able to do that and we've responded to that quickly, you know, mobilising almost a million pounds worth of work in four weeks. Thank you. Just a quick question to come back on that. Um, are we saying by March next year uh, we'll look to have completed that? Yes, that's the project plan that we've agreed with the contractors we've selected. Um, there is a target of 320 electrical inspections to do more or less each month from when they start on site next week. Um, what we've seen from other areas is inevitably there's some no access around that. So um, there are targets to do at least 80% of that, but there's an expectation that we'll probably have to do a mop-up after that for those people we've missed. But the contractors we've engaged and our own 
uh, investment in resources in the tenant team is going to mean that there's tenant liaison arrangements to try and make sure that we minimise that no access. And I'm sure people will, you know, will, will welcome the opportunity for that electrical inspection anyway. Thanks for that. Um, does anybody want to come in with a question at this particular point? Thank you, Chair. Um, why aren't we where we want to be? When I read it, the first thing I was thinking, well, so many things that aren't there. Why? I think as a result of the social housing regulatory programme, which the Council committed to last year, that involved a self-assessment with external party. It's involved an organisational wide corporate group with different ADs and project leads leading key elements of those consumer standards. And it was as a result of that that was we were able to identify the gaps, which has led us to being transparent with the regulator by saying we understand where those gaps are and more importantly we know how to put them right. Um, so that is why we've arrived at where we are and we're as much focused now on rectifying that and doing that root and branch review using a, a number of different component elements that will allow us to come to a decision around how we might you know, how we might structure that sort of going forward. Yeah. Um, how much do you think that the various repair services that the council have uh, commissioned have um, maybe not lived up to expectation and therefore, you know, properties have not been kept to the standard that we would like? There's probably colleagues who can support me in the room in terms of that, but I think in terms of at a tenant satisfaction and tenant and leaseholder satisfaction level, we know from the tenant satisfaction measures that we were required to submit to the regulator at the end of June that you know we're not where we want to be with satisfaction. Our overall satisfaction fell from 78% to 58%, and repairs contributed to that. Um, and that's why I mentioned in the report that there's a roadshow planned over the autumn where we're going to do several drop-ins at weekends, evenings, across a number of locality areas to really involve tenants and leaseholders in how we put together that improvement plan and drive up satisfaction. So that's one of the mechanisms to improve it. I don't know if the colleagues want to add further. Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, I think in terms of... Obviously, there's a number of different factors within the um, within the work that's been done. Uh, we've self-referred on a number of sort of issues. I think, in terms of the, it would be wrong to lay at the sort of uh, the contractor's door um, where we are in terms of that compliance work. But certainly, um, some of the work that we have done has revealed that there are some deficiencies in terms of the work that's been done by not just our main repairs contractor, but also some of the other contractors that we employ around that compliance piece. Um, I think in terms of sort of, you know, just to answer the general question of, you know, why are we where we are, I think as Tina said, you know, we've undertaken a root and branch um, review of all of our services um, in response to the new regulatory standard and that has revealed a number of areas where we need to improve in relation to that standard. Um, I think it's important to remember that, you know, again, if we take electrical testing as an example, um, you know, that, that is a, it is a requirement of the regulatory standard. It's not necessarily a, a requirement for us from a sort of, from, a from an otherwise a regulatory point of view. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, the question around the contractor, I think it's a factor, but I would not want to sort of lay any sort of um, full responsibility on our contractors um, for, for, you know, for where we are. Thank you. Um, can I just say that I think in future it might be an idea to do, you know, like 15-20% uh, of inspections of repairs that have been carried out, you know, not just rely on uh, customer satisfaction or dissatisfaction. But we used, I know, it's, I, I don't want to be sound like a dinosaur, but we used to do it and it did work. Um, and my final question on this is, all this work's obviously going to take um, money. And what impact will that have on the heavy housing revenue account? Um, so we took a report to Cabinet on the housing revenue account business plan in February. That pointed to some challenges over the 30-year forecast. Um, and there was a resulting consultation document um, around those choices for tenants and leaseholders in terms of balancing that budget. So 
there was a whole spectrum of choices around um, looking at how we use rent flexibility, how we look at service charges, how we look at efficiencies. You know, there's a whole suite of, of options. And I think what we need to do is undertake the consultation on those because those represent levers that we can pull in order to balance that budget. Because there is no doubt about it, there are challenges in that. And it's it's now public information from, from February that 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 HRA balances until 2042 and then we've got to make some decisions so doing a viability project around that now which is already in train and being scoped um, with reports intended for cabinet after Christmas um, is, is, is a key part of our agenda. Councillor Couchman, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, question in regards to the uh, relationship with the regulator. Would you say, what is the relationship with the regulator? Um, would you say it's uh, currently productive and, and certainly constructive? Absolutely. Um, the regulator has welcomed the transparency of the council. It's been very supportive in terms of the discussions. We've had a free flow of information and dialogue. Um, and we welcome the regulator's expertise in, in helping us to resolve and work with us to support our tenants and leaseholders going forward. Thank you. Um, I've got a question uh, on the same table, um, page five, under transparency, influence and accountability. Um, we have um, on the last column there, uh, the Housing Ombudsman has acknowledged the Cabinet decision um, to agree publication complaints, member lead and continuous learning. Um, and this is now on the council's website. In terms of homing, on, homing in on the continuous learning, um, do you mind just unpacking that and uh, potentially talk about how that would be measured? So the requirement under the Transparency, Influence and Accountability Standard, which is one of the uh, consumer standards set by the regulator, is to submit a self-assessment against the Housing Ombudsman Code um, and they changed the date of that to the 30th of June to be coterminous with the tenant satisfaction measures. Um, that was missed and there's subsequently been rectified. A report was done uh, by Zoe Waliki and her team to Cabinet at the end of August and that led to a positive response from the Housing Ombudsman following publication of that information on the 5th of September. Um, there are detailed actions within the improvement plan around how we can learn from all of the intelligence, you know, complaints, compliments and comments. Um, but I'd probably recommend that Zoe and the team are invited to a future scrutiny um, because, you know, they've, they've been doing lots of work around that. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody uh, have any questions, any more questions or comments? Okay. So we'll just quickly go through the recommendations. I don't think there's any glaring concerns, I suppose. Um, so the Cabinet tomorrow will be recommended to, uh, number one, acknowledge progress regarding the areas identified for self-referral to the regulator, social housing, and summarised as um, Annex 1. Number two, approve the tenant impact and risk assessment arising from the self-referral development with Staffordshire Fire and Rescue Services, shown at Annex 2. Number three, support homelessness and housing advisory board discussions on the, f uh, on the 1st of October 2024 to progress the autumn roadshow consulting on the tenant involvement engagement strategy launched at the tenant conference, um, summarised um, at Annex 3. And number four, agree recruitment of an independent tenant advocate to the Homelessness and Housing Advisory Board to support the tenant voice um, referral details to appointments and staffing committee for formal approval. Um, does anybody have any questions on those recommendations? Okay. Um, just on the last one, um, I was, I think it was possibly the last page, apologies, um, about that particular position. Um, do you mind just um, speaking a little bit more about that um, in terms of um, finding the right person for it? Any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So the um, independent ten tenant advocate um, came out as a result of discussions with our tenant consultative group and TPAS. 
who are the tenant participatory advisory service, who are sector leads in terms of supporting tenant and leaseholder resilience to challenge and hold account uh, councillors and officers really for performance um, and I think the view was that they wanted to strengthen um, their ability to be able to do that and some of the options around that were to recruit an independent tenant advocate so for those of you who are familiar with registered providers and boards it's not unusual to have non-executive directors for example it's usually paid on expenses um, and the view was that we would agree the principle with cabinet but then develop a role profile with tenants recruited uh, with tenants as well and leaseholders that they would um, work with them to enable you know and strengthen those discussions at the board so we're just working through the um, profile for that particular role um, we're using um, guidance from um, you know, from TPAS, Tenant Participation Advisory Service, in relation to that. So, you know, some emerging principles are it's not going to be politically affiliated. People, people coming forward should have expertise in housing. They should maybe should have experience in working with boards and with, um, you know, housing services, and and you know, have a real passion for driving tenant and leaseholder improvement. So that they're going to be emerging, but certainly. Uh, tenants are going to be at the heart of co-designing that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there's no more questions or indeed comments, um, I think it would... Yes, of course, Councillor yeah. Couchman. How long do you envisage this to take before you get a, an advocate? So it, assuming Cabinet approved this tomorrow, so then I think the view was we'd work up the more detailed proposal. Um, we talk through that at our appointments and staffing committee and that's not because it's going to be an employee but because we want to make sure we don't by default create an employee situation um, but I think we envisage that that will be by the end of uh, November when we've got those proposals and we can update cabinet further Thank you. okay um, so Happy to, I, I'm personally happy and I hope everybody else is to move um, these recommendations. Um, does anybody want to say, move to endorse them? Yeah. Uh, move to endorse is the, is the correct term. Um, so happy to move. Anybody would like to second? Councillor Couchman, all in favour? Fantastic. Okay. Um, well, thank you for... Um, the officers that have attended um, to present this report. Um, if you indeed have nothing else further on the agenda, I'm oh, happy to stay. Okay, <laughs> it's all fun and games. Uh, right. Okay. So um, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is number seven, which is uh, at this point. Yes, of course. We just have a councillor leaving the room. So um, just a reminder again, of course, this will be going to Cabinet tomorrow. Um, specific to this report, we have an apologies from the System Director of Assets as they're on annual leave. Would, who would like to kick this one on? Councillor Ben Clark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not going to ramble on um, for too long. It's quite a big, quite a big agenda. But um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who's contributed to this um, piece of work. Um, like before, we're not done yet, um, but this is certainly a milestone. I think for the leaseholders with the, the roofing issues. Um, I think that the key recommendation that they'll be interested in is, is number four, which is the recommendation of remedial works rather than the replacement, uh, and that follows the last announcement of full council. Um, but before handing over to, to Rob to add anything, I'd just once again like to give my, my gratitude to all those involved in this process, and that includes this committee and yourself, Chair, as well, in your previous capacity. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I've got lost. Um, this is agenda item seven, if I just turn the page. Uh, yes, agenda item seven. Is what I've got on my notes. Yep, so the last one was agenda item six. Yeah. We're now on to update on strategic review of the leaseholder service charge. Sorry, Councillor Couchman, you had me scared I was reading out the wrong report there. 
<laughs> um, but yeah, that was me done just saying thank you um, right. and handing over to anyone else you want like to add. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chair, nothing to add to uh, the introduction. Obviously, we've, we have itemised the recommendations for Cabinet in line with the recommendations of the Campbell Tickell report for, um, for transparency. So, um, again, it should be relatively straightforward for members to see um, how each of those recommendations has been carried forward. Thank you, Chair. I've got a question. Councillor Cashman. Yeah. Um, on the recommendations, to me, they don't read clearly. I think when we discussed it last time, we were made it very clear that people didn't have to have a roof replacement. They didn't necessarily have to have a repair at this time because their roofs were okay. Whereas that, from what I read of the recommendations, it inferred that they would, if they didn't have a replacement, they were going to be having a repair. Now, if I'm wrong, I'm you know I do apologise, but. Um, it, it, maybe it was the wrong time when I read it, I don't know. But we are saying that if they don't need a repair at the moment, they don't have to have one. Is that correct? So if I could, I could just pick up on that. So I think, you know, going back to the, the beginning of this process, there was um, obviously uh, surveys, surveys done by the council um, to assess the condition of the roofs. Um, for, for the majority of the, those inspected, what was recommended was a roof replacement at that time. Yeah. Campbell Tickell's work then has been to reinspect those roofs, um, to look at those roofs from the lens of, you know, additionally whether there was an opportunity to repair rather than replace, and have made recommendations on that basis. So, um, in terms of those roofs that have been inspected, um, it, there, there are the majority. It's been assessed that, in actual fact, they they require repair in order to extend the life of those roofs. Um, so, what Campbell Tickell have, have recommended in in most cases is basically that their repairs are undertaken um, and the roofs are reinspected in. Um, I think the time time limit was five to seven years, uh, with an expectation that there was potentially ten years life left in in the majority of those roofs. I, I believe, and I, I would have to sort of double check this, but I don't believe there are any of the um, the roofs in question that have been assessed as not requiring any type of repair. So the, there are repairs required in order to get that additional life um, span on those roofs, um, certainly in terms of the majority, if not all, of those roofs that were inspected. I don't think that's what exactly what we. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, I just, I didn't, that wasn't the impression I got when we finished the last meeting. My understanding at the last meeting was that some some roofs did not need doing until seven to ten years' time. Um, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, but that's why I recall. Yeah, so my understanding is we have a situation where there are um, repairs that are required. Um, the sort of upwards of 10 years is um, came from the report from the consultants, which of course uh, believes that with these repairs, we're looking at a, a life of up to 10 years uh, before any kind of replacement is required. However, um, the report does also outline um, from the consultants that there would be, um, it would be recommended that there is some sort of survey or inspection again at, uh, at at about five years onwards so i believe that's where we are at the moment um there were some obviously some recommendations that we had um on the back of the report last time in august um and we're going to go through that as well I, um so have you got any any more questions does that sort of answer it i suppose on the back of that yeah okay so i think what I, Unless anyone else has got any sort of questions, any other questions, um, what I was going to do was was go through the recommendations um, of the report and also touch on obviously the recommendations that we made last time. Um, I do have some concerns, um, but you know, that's just the way it is. I'll I'll be as constructive as as possible as ever. Um, so the first one. Um, is cabinet notes the recommendations set out in the cabinet, sorry, in the Campbell Tickell report, 
and specifically endorses the recommendations from that report for implementation. Details on the specific recommendations contained within the report are set out in the executive summary. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's not totally clear. It, you, I mean, if, if, if we're basically saying that we're endorsing the recommendations uh, from the T Campbell Tickell report, should we not just say that? Um, and that is what our recommendation was following the last meeting. So just to confirm, the question is uh, that from me on this is are we endorsing all recommendations from the CT report or just the executive summary? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm going to just have a quick flick through um, those specific recommendations from the um, from my um, understanding and my memory. Um, we are endorsing all actions, um, with the exception of there were some actions and recommendations made in respect to payment terms for leaseholders, um, where I believe there was a, um, some recommendations around extended terms, the making payment of loans. And I believe that those are recommendations which have not been are not being carried forward to be recommended to cabinet. Uh, apart from that, I believe that all of the recommendations are um, are um, are agreed. Okay. Well, that's that's kind of what I assumed that was the sort of the conversation. I suppose we we were always aware that sort of the financial that the, the payment particularly was always going to be a, a tricky one to to navigate. Um, I, I think we sort of felt, I, I, it felt like that um, in terms of the rest of the report from Campbell Tickell, um, it felt very sensible to, to follow those recommendations. Um, so yeah, I mean, it says cabinet notes the recommendations set out in the Campbell Tickell report uh, at appendix one, and that appendix one is the Campbell Tickell report. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a word twister, I suppose. Um, if that's the interpretation um, in terms of what you just said then, um, I, I'm, I'm fine with that at this stage. I'm not sort of majorly concerned. Does anybody else, any other members of the committee at this point have any uh, questions or comments regarding um, uh, recommendation one? Or shall we move on? Okay. So the second one. So cabinet endorses and reaffirms the recovery of sums related to leasehold service charge invoices in accordance with the corporate credit policy uh, previously approved by cabinet on the 31st of august 2023 um, so the only problem with that one is that we're sort of um paying a lot of attention to this corporate credit policy when actually the reality is, in many instances, uh, we just, you know, I would, I would suggest that uh, many of these issues can be resolved by a, a payment plan that doesn't sort of get near a so-called credit policy. Um, so I don't want to say it's a red herring um, on that one, but it's uh, potentially getting there. Um, so I, I do feel like it's a bit too general. And um, on that particular issue, I'd like to see uh, more of a, of, a, of a look at a reform of the current means test approach. Um, does anybody at this particular moment want to comment on that? It's not a direct question. Yep. Go for it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so in terms of our corporate credit policy, at the moment that sets out um, where we would offer credit on what terms we raise, debtors invoices, what our policy is for collection of debts and our debt provision. Um, so the view is that where um, a debtor can afford to pay the debt, so in this case a leaseholder, if they have the means to pay, we would expect them to pay in line with the agreement that they've signed up to. Uh, the recovery team do, though, um, take account of personal circumstances and if there is a need, they are more than happy to set up a payment plan which ensures that income to the council is maximised as well. Um, typically, they would offer payment terms of up to 12 months based on the um, leaseholder's income and outgoings. 
um, and would be more than happy to make those arrangements on an individual basis. But as I say, our expectation from the outset would be that where um, they can afford to pay, then they should pay in, in line with the agreement. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, Councillor Couchman, uh, we have a question. Yeah, um, I think it's unfair for people who can't pay to expect them to be able to find the money within 12 months. I think we've got to have some flexibility there because I'm not, I'm not suggesting for a minute that people who own properties shouldn't pay their way and get their repairs done and stuff like that. But I think that from my knowledge of this, a lot of the leaseholders in these flats are very elderly and they're not wealthy um, and I don't think if you said to them you've got a bill for £9,000 they're going to be able to find that money in 12 months so I'm, I'm just wondering if there's going to be any flexibility for those people rather than just saying it's got to be 12 months um, yeah thank you um, yeah so that we, we do offer some flexibility um, on the payment arrangements um, the tw we, we would expect payment up front in normal circumstances. People have the, have the income to pay it. Um, if somebody says they haven't got the income, we will offer 12 months pretty much um, as a matter of course. Um, and what we ask is if, if, if people are still struggling to find the payment over 12 months, we look at we take it on their individual circumstances and we will offer um, longer term payment plans if we believe, believe it sees fit. So we do look at their income. Uh, we, are, we are conscious, obviously, like, as, you, as you said, uh, Councillor, that there are some elderly people affected by this. Um, and we will offer extended payment plans where we believe is appropriate. But we do ask for proof of their income and what expenditure they've got before we do this. Can I say thank you? I, I just, I, you know, I appreciate that people need to pay their bills, but it's how they do it. So thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Summers. Just on that point, so um, are we ever at the stage where we would consider uh, putting a charge on the property to recover the costs if they haven't been recovered so that when it's sold, we can get that money back? Um, yes, yeah, so, um, we, we've, we've got a, a couple of cases where that might be an option. Um, we've, we've looked at individual circumstances if we believe we, we have to get some legal advice on, on that matter, but that's something that we could is one of the options available to us if, if required yeah on this particular recommendation um i've always had a concern in terms of the process i suppose in terms of the means test and the criteria um i'm not going to say who it's from because that would be massively uh, unprofessional um but i did have an email response from somebody from the council at a particular stage and just to quote, um, we don't have a set criteria. We will judge each case on its merits and take into account their general circumstances. Um, to me, that's slightly worrying because actually I would rather see a set criteria. I don't see why we shouldn't have um, a set criteria. Um, in terms of the um, means test um, that currently is used um, it's I mean it's fairly fairly standard in terms of questions about um, income and, 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 and stuff like that um, I don't really see it um, as something that's going to provide consistency because I'm assuming it's not always necessarily the same person from the council level making these decisions um, so I would worry that there is um, the possibility of inconsistency and I don't think that would be working towards um, getting to where we want to be in terms of you know payment options um, the other one I was going to uh, mention was uh, that you might want to comment on is um, which actually sort of moves into recommendation six in terms of the s20 notices which of course have been produced or re uh, mastered by Campbell Tickell, the consultants, um, specifically on the letter regarding the payment options, it does talk about um, an, in an invoice which will be payable within 28 days um, and sort of not really much else, you know. So um, 
I, I'm not sort of trying, I understand that we want to try and recover these um, amounts as quickly as possible and, and that's clearly um, something that um, the council would, would, rather, would rather have. But what we're trying to do here is be a little bit more understanding to the economic situation for many of our leaseholders and, and indeed residents. Um, and so if there are options like um, a 12 month um, payment, repayment package, um, that needs, to, in my opinion, to be advertised and, and, and a bit more talked about than it currently is. So in, summarize, in summary of what I've just said there, there's, there's not a set criteria in terms of these, this payment um, plan for an individual leaseholder. So in terms of where we're saying um, endorsements and reaffirms the recovery of sums on charges on invoices, um, uh, that to me is, is a worry um, because we're not quite there yet in revising uh, a policy around it. Anybody want to come back on that? Okay, um, I think I think the issue where we, if we was to put a payment plan on every invoice that we will give you twelve months, then we're, the, the people who have got the money to pay it will will be taking that twelve months. So it is, isn't a set criteria in terms of we do we do judge every case on its merits and look at the affordability of the of the, of the person to pay it. Thank you. I would just suggest that um, you know you could have something on there that states um, there might well be an option for a 12-month um, payment plan um, subject to conditions, and obviously as part of the um, beans test um, approach which uh, follows, um, that can then be judged. Clearly, if somebody is saying that they've got a huge income or they've got um, huge um, assets uh, in their portfolio, then then of course. Um, but I do believe it's um, under this new um, revised way of, of um, communicating with um, uh, leaseholders, we should make available these sorts of options um, so that somebody literally isn't uh, going to be in a state of panic looking at a letter saying you've got 28 days to pay uh, a huge amount of money. Because we're not necessarily talking about just repairs here, we're talking about renewal at some point in the future, which we know could be more than 40,000, um, I'm sure at that point, uh, a lot more as well at that particular time. Does anybody want to come back on that or you don't have to, but? What's the, what, okay, so my question is, what's the reason we don't want to say um, that they have an option subject to criteria that they have to earn 28 days, to, uh, sorry, um, they have a 12 month uh, plan to pay it back? I think it's, um Baron has said it's about setting that precedent. We want to ensure that we collect the income that's due on a timely basis, um, and that we're not incurring, uh, you know, administrative costs or potentially going down the line where we've got um, outstanding debts that are, are building up. Um, as Farron has said, you know, we do we do offer payment plans where they're needed. Um, and I think on the, the invoice, we always say, you know, if you've got any issues about struggling to pay, to get in touch with the recovery team. So, um, you know, they're always willing to, to assist wherever they can. But our, in terms of ensuring that um, the council's finances are, are on a firm footing, then we would always make, want to make the point that sums are, are due um, when the, the debt is raised. Yeah, I just I would suggest that twelve months in the whole scheme of things isn't exactly going to you know cause the, the council to be a breaking point. Um, but what it does do, considering that we know that some of these repairs in these in this instance um, could be as much as well. We had a quote um, uh, the last time we, we we spoke on this upwards of eight thousand pounds. If you're looking at an invoice saying that you've got twenty eight days to pay eight thousand pounds. I would assume that most people will be slightly scared and worried about that. So anything that you can do to alleviate it at that stage, uh, I believe, would um, would massively help. Councillor Summers, I didn't actually put my hand up. I was gonna. Um, yeah. So I, I um, obviously we we have a balance to to maintain. We don't want to scare residents. We don't want to put them in a position that makes them feel financially overburdened and. Um, 
you know, the value of these properties and cost of everything has gone up considerably perhaps since these leaseholders took on their lease in the first place. Um, it's not a great way of buying a property. I hope they get abolished at some point. But um, in, in terms of, uh, I've mentioned the charge aspect before. Now, um, what I'm concerned about, if we're going to be talking about protecting the council's financial position, are we likely to see these debts appear on the write-off report at any time to say we can't recover them, it's done and dusted, or can we get in there that we we, imme we immediately after 12 months perhaps look to put that charge on rather than it going to recovery and just not being paid and being written off by us? I mean, it technically could be an option for people who, you know, really cannot afford to pay it could be you know you don't have to worry about this we get the money back when the property sold so i mean it, it it's it seems to me a, a sensible precaution for us and an option for them as well um yeah so we, if um if, if we believe that is really going to be the only realistic option we've got to collect the money then we would start the process um pretty much imme immediately um Obviously, we've 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 got details of their income, and we and we can see from that, that 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 may be the only option available to us. So we would we would probably get that started. Um, obviously, with the um, if, if we were to offer an arrangement, we wouldn't wait for the twelve months. We would we would do that monthly. So we would know somebody's not going to pay, um, and and we do engage. We have a, um, a team of two who are dealing specifically with the sundry debts and the and the section twenty debts. Um, uh, but just for a, a point of inconsistency, that any arrangements that go over the 12 months are always agreed by management as well. So we, we, have, we do try and have a consistent approach to it as well. So it's not a case of two people in similar circumstances. One gets a long-term arrangement, one doesn't. We, we, we try and be consistent. So we get a management approval of any extended arrangements. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Couchman. I think the problem is that this is an exceptional time because this case has been dragging on and leaseholders were not aware and then they, they're, they're worried that they're going to get these bills. I think we need to treat them very sensitively. Whereas in the future, if we go to a further further down, when we talk about um, you know the proper service improvement plan, they will know what's coming down the line and can then hopefully budget accordingly. So they will have years of notice that, you know, in six years' time, all the roofs are going to be done again. Well, we, not roofs, but you know what I mean, whether it's doors or whether it's windows, whatever, um, that they can then plan for that. Whereas at the moment, they're in limbo because they're not sure. They've had the bills, then they've had this report, this ongoing saga. Then whenever they do get a, a bill now, I think what we need to do is just treat it a bit more sensitive. I agree with what you're saying about we don't want people taking advantage of the council, but at the same time, I think this particular group of people have been put through the mill a bit, uh, well, quite a lot, actually, and I think, therefore, we should um, give them a bit more consideration and care. Did you want an officer to come back on that? Um, I'm, I wouldn't be too sure on the legalities of breaking policy. Um, I agree that the leaseholders have gone through a lot, and uh, um, from what officers have said, I think that there is that sort of um, that flexibility within the policy itself. So uh, I, I would want to ensure myself as the as the cabinet member that the that leaseholders are properly engaged with, and that no one is left behind in this process, and that each person has sort of the the policy that is sorry the payment plan that is catered to their needs. Um, like I say, avoiding anyone taking advantage of the council I would just suggest just to come back on that what you said there in terms of sort of breaking the policy you know it in my view we're not sort of breaking the policy so to speak we have the corporate credit policy that is a policy with now I think one of the reasons why um, potentially there's fears around talking about a 12-month payment plan is because we don't necessarily have 
a robust uh, criteria that we work to. Um, I was just looking at the Campbell Tickell report from the consultants, and um, I was just looking at the, um, the part page tw uh, 78 we have at 4.23. Um, this is their uh, view, Campbell Tickell. There is no TBC guidance on where alternate repayment options might be offered or a methodology for officers to follow to make these decisions. In view of this, there is a danger that individual leaseholders may not receive the same advice and options. So, you know, from what I've seen, from my experience um, with this issue, I'd like to see um, more of a, um, a robust uh, policy um, that has um, in it a, a solid criteria uh, a, a solid mean, a ways of means testing um, uh, to just rule out any kind of inconsistencies. And I think at that particular point as well, you could then tie that in and link it in with talking about a 12-month policy because with that you, of course, can, um, you can uh, link it to that criteria so people aren't just willy-nilly saying, okay, then I don't have to pay in 28 days when I can, but actually now I'm going to pay in 12 months. Um, it just has to be. We just have to be robust, and I think we can then we can then do that. Is my feelings, uh, Councillor Summers? Did you have your hand up? Yeah, um, I do agree. I think we do have to have a criteria on it um, and a p strict policy on who qualifies. Um, if you're going to make that into a recommendation, I would second it. Yep, it was flowing towards that direction. Um, I've, I've sort of noted it down, um, so, but I didn't know if it came more under what will be um, a later recommendation, so if that's okay, I'll come back to it. Um, but, but yes, I do believe we need to, I would suggest that we have a recommendation specific to that. Um, on this particular recommendation, does anybody have any more questions or comments? before we move on to the next one. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yes, recommendation three. Uh, Cabinet approves the development of a service improvement plan that considers the timings and resources required to implement the recommendation set out at point one above. See draft at appendix two. And by the way, um, just as a reminder, that was one of the recommendations uh, in the August corporate scrutiny uh, that we uh, recommended to, to Cabinet, uh, moved by Councillor Jay and seconded by Councillor Price, which was the Council further develop a service improvement plan, and this come back to the corporate scrutiny committee. So we do have, um, under Appendix 2, um, what potentially you could call a um, service improvement plan. Um, I've got just um, one question to start on this one. So clearly on there, you've got Truman Change. Do you want to just, is, is that who's put this together? Sorry, Chair, in terms of the, um, the improvement plan. Yeah, so we've had some, um, some support from Truman Change around that improvement plan. I was just wondering, seeing as we are still using Campbell Tickell, why was the choice made for Truman Change to advise on this rather than Campbell Tickell? Apologies, Chair, I've just lost the report. If I can just have a moment. Chair, can I just ask? Um, Councillor Summers. Are we still going to be court when Councillor Coates leaves to make any kind of recommendations or continue without Councillor Hadley in the room as well? There's only going to be three of us. Yeah, so we still have three councillors at that particular point. Just about enough, thankfully. Um, where were we? Um, somebody answering that on the, on the um, service improvement plan? Thanks, Chair. Just locating my papers on my computer. I do apologise. Just to let you know, it's Appendix 2 um, and also referred in the report as 
the service improvement plan. Yeah, so um, just to confirm, we have consulted with Campbell to Cal on, the, on this, but the actual administration and the pulling together of the improvement plan has been undertaken by uh, Truman Change, um, who are working with us across a range of sort of improvement pieces um, uh, and linked to the um, social housing regulatory program, amongst other pieces of work. So it has actually been informed by, um, by work that we've done with Campbell to Cal. So anybody uh, in the group have any questions specific to this recommendation? Is it costing us more by going with two different companies? The, um, well, Campbell, Truman Change are providing us with a range of services in relation to social housing um, uh, regulatory programme and supporting a number of projects that we're doing. Um, in terms of the, um, the work that they've done, um, in effect, what we were doing with Campbell to Cal was using up um, some of the days that they had from their previous piece of work. So um, I think in terms of answering your question, we would have been paying one or other of them for the two parts of the process. So one is sort of pulling together the improvement plan and doing those elements of consultation with, with officers. The other is providing that expert con consultative advice. So um, effectively, we've paid the same. We've just paid two different um, parties. Do you want to come back? It seems to me that maybe the contract then wasn't very well thought out if we've got spare days for these people to uh, work on. Obviously, at the beginning of the contract with, uh, with Campbell to Kell, they provided us with an estimate of how many days they would need to put in in order to complete the work. Um, they were actually able to accomplish some of that without utilising all of the days within the contract. Um, that's always often the case with um, with consultancy contracts. Okay. So um, again, I'll try and be constructive as possible. Um, one thing I noticed was um, in the actual report, um, yeah, the leaseholder update report, um, where you've got, I suppose, the first table, um, which I think is on the second page. Uh, what you then see in the improvement plan is literally just a copy and paste of that, which is slightly bizarre, uh, in my personal opinion. Why would you copy and paste just something that's already in the report and put it into something that you want to call an improvement plan? Um, I, don't, I don't think this improvement plan is really robust enough. Um, and as an example... Um, the first one there where we're talking about, which it describes as a work stream, by the way, um, revised tw Section 20 notices so that they're more customer friendly and the explanation of works goes beyond statutory requirements. Um, I, would, I would hope that there would be sort of evidence of that clearly specified, maybe in the actions um, or somewhere on there. Um, I understand, obviously, the assistant director is not here, and that's quite a specific one. If you do have any um, evidence of where it's gone beyond the state, uh, statutory requirements, um, it would be nice to, to hear. Thank you, Chair. I'm not able to uh, provide that information. However, you know, um, two things, I suppose. One is, obviously, the what was asked for was for us to bring the improvement plan back through um, uh, to corporate scrutiny for comment um, by way of consultation. So obviously that's the opportunity to do that tonight. So any comments or um, anything you want us to take away by way of, uh, a way of enhancing or improving the, improving the improvement plan, we'll obviously make note of that um, uh, tonight. In terms of your specific question, no, I'm not able to answer that at this stage, but obviously we will look into that and come back to you with further information.
apologies. First page of the improvement plan uh, at the bottom there, um, it talks about the council should clearly save the original dated 20, section 20 consultation letters. Now, obviously, that was quite a controversial part of the strategic review because, as we know, uh, letters went out with the wrong date. Um, again, um, it sort of says it will be properly recorded uh, in the actions, um, but how does it go about doing that? Is there a different uh, application, for example, um, that is being used um, to host these letters? Um, is there a different process involved? Do we have any specifics like that? And not at this time, Chair, but we'll be happy to take that query and come back to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so also on the, um, on the improvement plan, um, we don't have um, enough, in, in my view anyway, um, we have a little section at the end that talks about the resourcing requirements. Um, just to add in the development of this, I would suggest that those resourcing requirements should be a column um, that's included um, for every uh, section. Um, and again, because you want feedback, um, I would also suggest um, considering using existing uh, applications which are um, tried and tested examples might well be Microsoft Project. Um, I'm assuming you might well have um, access to this because, of course, we do use um, Microsoft-related um, software in, in the council. Um, but it does mean that we have... Um, it does mean that we can def uh, uh, define um, data uh, and actionable uh, tasks um, a lot better. You can, of course, use color coding um, to present um, better than what I would suggest is is in the report. Um, it's it, yeah, it's just it's just a bit strange the layout because, of course, you've also got progress and complete as two columns, but then you've got the color coding on the complete, but then you've got nothing on progress. Everything sort of seems to be green, but um, it. it it's it's not particularly clear. I would suggest it just needs to be be looked at. Um, does anybody have any more questions on this particular recommend recommendation, Councillor Couchman? I'm just looking at um, the Truman Change report about service plans and delivery. How far in the future would you get? Um, sorry, I've, I've phrased, phrased that wrong. When you get your um, schedule of works improvement plan how long a gap have you got before they start improving so that you've got work towards a cost so they're going to are they going to say to you right we're coming to do the windows in six months or we're coming to do the windows in two years or five years when will the leaseholders know that information sorry chair i'm not sure i understand the question is it possible to to clarify for instance, as a householder, if I know that I've got repairs coming up, I will budget accordingly. So I know that next year I am going to have a new roof. The following year, I need a new patio door. So if the leaseholders, when they get their plan of works, because that's what we're going to do, isn't it? We're going to give them a forward plan so they know what's coming. What I want to know is how long in the future before we first give them their first plan of work because what I would hate to see is that we've just get over the roofs and then the next thing is they're told in six months time this is going to be done. So I want to know how much time we're giving them so that they can budget accordingly. Yeah, so the, there's a number of sort of improvements recommended by Campbell to Kettle, yeah. one of which, obviously, on the back of completion of the stock condition survey, that we'll be able to provide people with a, a minimum of five-year um, programme. Um, so over at that period, we would be able to be clear what, what was programmed and what was expected to be undertaken by way of replacements um, and, and major works. Um, in terms of then of the... Um, there's also statutory consultation 
um, period, which uh, again, um, I'd have to check on the specific time scales, but obviously we, we're required to give in, in advance of any works actually being no undertaken um, prior notification. Um, and I've, again, you'll have to excuse me, I forget the, the specifics on that, but it's a matter of months in terms of you know, what will be done within that year. So that program will be, um, will be provided once we've completed the stock condition survey and we can be clear on what our expected capital works will be. Uh, any more questions on this particular recommendation or comments? No? Okay. So moving on to the next one, um, which is recommendation four, cabinet approves the commencement of remedial works in line uh, with surveys that have been completed. This would include commencement of consultations and the issuing of invoices upon completion. Um, at this particular moment, does anybody have any questions or am I okay to ask mine? <laughs> okay, so um, I, I do have concerns again with this one um, because it's open to all sorts of problems in my view. Um, it was talked about, I think, in the last meeting, remedial works potentially being around um, 2,000 to 8,000. Um, we, we asked for a breakdown. I think that was one of the questions. Um, and there was uh, questions around, um, will the felt um, be uh, repaired or replaced? Um, has there been a decision on that? Um, so if anybody can answer those questions, um, go for it. Um, so one of the things that was in the CT report was uh, it talked about remedial works. Under 8.4, re remedial works have been identified to extend the life of roofs and to provide an estimated 10-year life. CT recommends that TBC assesses the costs of the remedial works to each using its uh, QLTA, which is Qualifying Long-Term Agreement. So I don't really see any of that happening. I'm not saying it would happen now um, because it would be part of the process, but um, I, I would feel uncomfortable sort of green lighting, um, saying that we're suddenly going to start issuing invoices because I want to know that those costs, those repair remedial works, the costs involved, are going to be fair and proportionate. Um, so, can anybody give me a little bit of reassurance? So, the just just to pick up on that. So, the, obviously, the uh, Campbell Tickell surveyors made recommendations about specific works to each specific property. Those have been costed, um, and if you like, a program of works has been pulled together with the council's contractor. Um, if if that was, an, I, I, again, I would have to check the notes, if that was a request that you, you had sight of that programme of works and those specific costs and you haven't done, then I, I apologise for that and we will um, send those to you. Um, but those, as I say, those costs have been, um, have been uh, taken in effect of uh, directly from the works that were recommended by Campbell to Kell, um, and those have been done by the council's contractor. So there, there is an estimated cost. Um, which again would form then the um, so what we would we would then need to do because these are ma these are still major works is go through the um, consultation process so the issuing of um, section 20 notices um, which obviously again using the suite of letters and the information that was provided for us by Campbell to Cal so that process in effect once Cam Cam uh, cabinet have approved these recommendations would, would commence in terms of people then being um, given that that sort of um, that that stage of um, consultation, um, and provided part of that is providing that with that with that estimated cost. And if I may, just to confirm, that would inc that would include um, the QLTA. Sorry, QLTA. The QLTA. So in the report, in I'm assuming it would do because based on what you've just said. Um, the process would, would be the same in terms of the S20 process. But it says um, CT recommends that TBC assesses the cost of remedial works to each using its QLTA to, be, to, to, to enable a decision to be made on the value of progressing with the remedial works. Okay, I'll, 
Karen, um, I will um, have a look at that because I don't want to misinform the committee. So I will um, I will have a look at that in terms of confirming what um, that process specifically includes. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, can I just get a clear answer on the on the whole felt issue? Are we saying that these roofs don't require felt if the felt is considered um, in, in no fit state. Um, the report, of course, just to give context to this, the report from Campbell Tickout says that the felt isn't required um, as long as the tiles, of course, are, are watertight. Um, but in, 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 as an example, many uh, you know old buildings don't necessarily have um, felt. And of course, felt can actually be a negative in the sense of increase in uh, potential for increase in, in condensation. So is it okay to get an answer on that in terms of the position? So, um, as, as I said, the, um, the works set out and the works to be undertaken are those recommended by, um, by, by Campbell to Kell. And, um, yeah, as, as we'll be aware, they um, took the view that, in actual fact, that Sarkin felt it was not necessarily for that to re be replaced. So unless they have recommended replacement of Sarkin felt in, in any specific property, then um, the, the works would not include the um, replacement of that. And this is where it's slightly confusing how we're talking about um, such a large um, cost range for these works because in, in my view if we're talking about replacing a few tiles which by the way um, the survey report pretty much um, outlined not in all instances I must add I, I, I understand um, but uh, you know I, I would be concerned that um, I'd be concerned with what the evaluation is in terms of the cost there of these remedial works um, so um, if Anybody, unless anybody has a comment or question on this recommendation, I was going to suggest that um, the uh, recommendation is is revised, um, and I'll just read out what I've got here. So the original um, recommendation was cabinet approves the commencement of remedial works in line with the surveys that have been completed. This would include the commencement of consultations and the issuing of in invoices upon completion. So again, we've gone straight to the invoices. I'm just worried about how we get, then get to the cost. That's my concern, just to put it on the table. So I would suggest um, the recommendation would be cabinet approve the process for remedial works based on the completed surveys and utilizing a QLTA approach. A detailed cost breakdown must be submitted to the next available corporate scrutiny committee as a briefing note. Both these costs and the final invoices require approval from the portfolio holder for housing and homelessness and planning. I feel that's reasonable. Um, so I'm not even suggesting it needs to come back as an agenda item to corporate scrutiny because I, you know, I don't want to delay anything. I want you know the works to happen, but I do feel there should be. Um, a check on this. It, we, we don't want to go straight to invoice and suddenly have the whole issue exposed again. Everyone's unhappy with the costs and so on. There just needs to be some, some checks. Councillor Couchman. Thank you. I think if we'd had the breakdown tonight, then we wouldn't need to recommend what you're recommending. But I think it's perfectly reasonable in the fact that we haven't got all the information. I mean, it's one of those because clearly there's an S20 process, so of course, you know, that. There would have to be um, a process of going out and obviously getting getting those um, those prices accumulated. So I understand there is that to do. Um, I just feel that there just needs to be um, somebody to to kind of give it the green light, I suppose. And I feel that you know Councillor Clark is is in a position would be a good person to be able to do that um, uh, just to ensure that those. Um, final costs for the remedial works on something um, that's considered outrageous and that they are fair and just based on the available information. Um, would somebody like to move that? I'm happy to move it. Um, I'm also then looking for a seconder, I guess, on that particular one. <laughs> so we've got me moving. Um, is everyone in support? Excellent. 
Yes, of course. So, okay, moving on to the uh, recommendation five. Um, cabinet approves the use of Campbell Tickell to assist in the development of the leaseholder policy. Um, guess what? We've already done that um, because of the last one, um, which was um, uh, recommendation five in that instance, well, same one as this one actually, um, we continued the uh, we supported the continuation of working arrangements with Campbell Tickell to produce a formal leaseholder policy. Okay. So again, that wasn't to do with the improvement plan, that is a leaseholder policy. Um, so I'm sure that will come back at some point. Uh, any questions, comments on that one? Brilliant. Okay. Uh, recommendation six, uh, Cabinet approves the updated S20 notices produced by Campbell Tickell. Um, so yeah, we, 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 we kind of did do that. Um, last time it was recommendation two, which was endorsing the content of the section 20 notices produced by Campbell Tickell and approved submitting them to cabinet. Um, so one thing I noted in the minutes from the August corporate scrutiny, um, although it wasn't a recommendation, um, but it was noted in the minutes, which was it was highlighted by the committee, and I can't remember who said it, um, apologies. It was highlighted by the committee that the new uh, suite of letters was still not customer friendly enough. I don't know if any officers are able to come back on that. Were, were there any adjustments? So the discussions that we've had around the um, commencing any um, further consultations and issuing any further notices is that whilst we will be using the um, the, the suite of letters from uh, Campbell Tickell, we will also be looking to have a, a covering letter um, which will include um, uh, a, a sort of a letter from the portfolio holder um, that will just explain what it is we are doing, uh, make sure that any contact details are understood, um, you know, deal with some of the softer issues. So we will be supplementing that information um, based on the discussion that we had at the last uh, corporate scrutiny. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I support that. Seems logical and um, seems like a good idea. Um, any questions at the moment from members? Okay. Um, so that ties into that earlier recommendation about the whole payment. Sorry to come back to it. <laughs> the whole payment options issue. Um, so again, on those letters, as part of the S20 notices, um, we've only got it saying that this invoice will be payable so it says, word by quote, the invoice will be payable within 28 days. Therefore, to, it's, therefore, it's important that you begin to consider how you will finance your share of the costs. Um, so it does talk about assistance, but the first one was you could consider setting up a savings account in the interim in that you can make regular payments into and those savings would normally earn you, earn you interest. Um, Mm, okay. I mean, obviously at that point, it's because it's the first stage of the S20 process, it's talking about the potential for works. Um, but, but clearly in, in terms of these remedial works, I'm assuming that will happen a lot faster this time. Um, so it is what it is. Um, I was just so coming on back, coming back on that one and also um, back to recommendation two, which was that um, we endorse the recovery of sums related to leaseholder service um, charges, invoices in accordance with the corporate credit policy. I'm not particularly happy about that. Um, that's my personal opinion. Um, I was going to suggest that we put a recommendation, um, which hopefully falls into what Councillor Summers um, said earlier um, in terms of bringing it to a, a recommendation. Um, so I've just scribbled this down, so bear with me, but I basically um, I would suggest we recommend that TBC review and revise the payment criteria and statement of means to ensure fairness and consistency. Is that something that members can support? as a recommendation from this committee. Yeah. So TBC review and revise um, the payment criteria and statement of means 
to ensure fairness and consistency. Are you talking about sort of corporate credit rating or are you talking no. about distinguished division? Um, Do you mean the right to compare? You're talking about the sort of the payment bank criteria or um, the payment? Yeah, the because I wanted to separate the this um, what it refers to as a corporate credit policy. Um, because what we're dealing with here is, um, in my view, in a way, the si a, 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 a situation which I'm assuming might be undertaken whereby um, a leaseholder does panic at 28 days and would rather or would be um, willing to enter into agreement that could well be um, a 12-month payment plan. Um, but I would suggest based on the recommendations from Campbell Tickell, which talked about a lack of criteria and um, some of the comments that I've had on email, that um, there is a revision to the criteria aspect and the statement of means um, to ensure that we do have the fairness and consistency. So you mean the criteria when, when you come into a payment plan? Is that, is that the criteria? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we're not we're not talking about the corporate credit no, policy. No, no. Yeah. 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 We we get the evil looks. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering if that word in is quite because we weren't sure whether I know you'll be there to explain it to yeah. or whether yeah. you just need to hear a little bit further on the wording. So um so that's it's it's like it's the criteria for a special payment plan, isn't it? That's what you're saying. Is that, is that so right? it's a it's a review, and I mean I can I, we can change it to review and possibly revise, um, the uh, so for TBC to review and re and possibly revise the payment um, plan criteria, um, including the statement of means because that is. Um, something that clearly is at the yeah. moment as part of the process is undertaken um, to ensure consistency and fairness. Is, yep. that, is that okay? Does that make sense to, to you, Brian? Do you sort of that? I mean, I would suggest that would be something as part of the leaseholder policy moving forward would be looked at anyway. That would be part of um, the improvement plan and the policy going forward. Okay. Do you know that? Yes. Yeah. Um, who would like to second? Uh, Councillor Summers, all in favour? Okay, thank you. Um, do we want to, and I'm totally open to this because I know there's sort of concerns in terms of um, you know, the council being paid. I don't believe that there is, but I'm totally open to, to the views. But do we want to specifically recommend that the S20 letters, which talk about payment within 28 days, and that's fine, but I would suggest um, there is a sentence on there where it talks about um, there being um, uh, potential for a 12-month uh, payment plan um, with an uh, with the stipulation that this would be under certain conditions and um, criteria or the other way around. Councillor Coachman. I think earlier on, um, didn't uh, they say that when they sent the invoice out, they'd send it with a covering letter from the portfolio holder, which would cover what you've just said? about payment plan and stuff like that and make it more user friendly. So I think that would cover it. Um, can Councillor uh, Ben Clark confirm? I think, I mean, again, I'll bring Joe into to this. We can certainly refer to the corporate credit policy and any flexibility within that. Um, but I, I think the conversation earlier was that there wouldn't be any guarantee or payment plan specifically um, on, a, on a sort of blanket basis. I don't know if that's um, something you want to confirm there, Jo. Yes, I think that is what we would be saying. Going back to my previous point, we would expect if they, if leaseholders can afford to pay that they do. Um, my understanding is that the payment options letter is just a draft one at the minute for consideration. 
So we could certainly look to to um, update that and amend it and make it more in line with with our approach going forward. Um, but yes, just to reiterate, the options to have a payment plan would be there, but not the first option. We would expect payments in full initially. I'm going to come back on that slightly because I'm not suggesting that, of course, they have the option to enter into a 12-month payment plan. Clearly, from a TPC point of view, that is not the best approach. If they can pay it uh, within a timely manner, um, certainly 28 days, of course, we should be pushing for that. I'm just merely making the point that due to certain circumstances um, set by a certain uh, set of criteria, which in the earlier recommendation would be revised, um, we could suggest that um, they may have the potential, and of course we can talk about the wording, they might have the potential or the availability to enter into a 12-month payment plan. But it doesn't in any way state that they can, it's just um, a possibility based on um, their current circumstances. And by the way, in terms of the draft, um, the so-called draft uh, S20 notices in the recommendation, um, it doesn't actually say draft S20 notices. So in terms of that going to cabinet, that I assume would be what is, what what will be used in the letters going forward. Does anybody want to come back on that? Because I'm not saying that we are saying that we're opening it up to a 12-month payment plan. It's under a certain set of conditions and criteria. Yep. So the sorry, just to confirm that the we we will be in terms of the sort of core of the correspondence around the section 20, we'll be utilising the letters as drafted by Campbell to Cal. Um, so um, the letters as drafted by Campbell to Cal contained within the report will be those that are used. What we're talking about here, I think, is the supplementary letter that we'll we'll sort of be adding um, to deal with any sort of additional. Um, uh, information we want to dis dispense. Yeah, I'm only just going on recommendation six, which is what we have in front of us, which is the cabinet approves the updated S20 notices produced by Campbell Tickell. Um, so I would assume if we're approving that, that is what the letters are going to be. Um, I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be some minor alterations um, potentially, but we don't clearly want to open it up to huge amounts of, um, of change, I would suggest. Um, but hey ho, um, Councillor Couchman, did you have a question I or just comment? Pointing out that it doesn't say anywhere that there will be a covering letter from the portfolio holder. So if you don't put it in the recommendation, it doesn't happen to have to happen. Whereas if it's in the recommendation, it has to happen to me, you know. And I would hate to think that we've come up this way, we've we've worked on, we know that we want we want people to pay, which is fair enough. We also know that there are going to be some people that. Are we're going to be finding it very difficult. We're not going to make it a huge thing about, oh, you can have 12 months to pay. It's going to be very discreet. But at the same time, if we don't have that covering letter in, then we, we can't do that. So um, I think part of you know that recommendation should have approves the updated uh, Section 20 notices al alongside the covering letter from the portfolio holder. Because if we don't put it in, Often these things get missed out. Look, with respect, um, you know, I, I see you, you're conflating this um, uh, possible recommendation with suggesting that we're, we're saying that um, they are open to use a 12-month payment plan. I'm not suggesting that whatsoever. Um, I'm just merely suggesting that it's put on there um, just for those that are going to be worried and scared um, and you know as I've said a certain uh, it would it might be as strict as anything goes it might be as you know it might literally be that they have got no job uh, no assets or whatever so it can be as strict as possible um, but I would suggest at least there's something on there and uh, and to suggest that there would be um, that would be a possibility under under a set, a, a set criteria and set of conditions, and of course the means test as well. So I don't. I'm just trying not to. I don't want you to conflate those two. That's not. That's not what I've said. Um, we're just merely giving it as an option, 
and uh, as councillor uh, councillor uh, couchman has said that that would either be on the main s20 letter um or it could be a covering letter um i'm absolutely fine with that but i just think it should be on there at some point councillor summers right considering that it isn't actually official that we offer a 12-month payment plan it isn't actually set down anywhere we can't really say that we can't put it in a letter going out to the tenants what we could say is if you feel you're going to have financial difficulty paying this invoice please talk to us as soon as possible you know arrangements could be made something along those kind of lines we can't set ourselves 12 months we can't say there's an, possibly an option of 12 months we have to be straight down the line and we also have to um, give ourselves the flexibility of either reducing or increasing that per you know on a, on a case by case basis we, we we can't narrow it down like that um I, I would suggest we 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 keep it very general and say please speak to us if you if you're going to face financial difficulty you know as soon as possible chair if i could come back to that um just if I can just say something in response to that, I'll come to you, if, if you don't mind. Um, I just want you. To, I just want members to be aware um, on what on one of the emails um, that came back um, from finance um, when I was on cabinet. Um, it included a file called debt recovery me measures, and um, in that, which is a document. Um, quote, it says, it, if, if, if it is deemed that they are unable to pay us in a short period of time, we would look to offer a 12-month payment plan in respect to these cases. So, you know, that is part of what is already existing policy or criteria, whatever you want to say. So I'm not sort of plucking this out. This is, this is, this is what in, this has actually come um, from finance to me um, when I was a portfolio holder. Sorry, Councillor um, Clark. Just while they're pouring a drink, I'll just come back in and say, okay, fair enough. I mean, but it, it's it's kind of like pinning us down to a 12-month when there are perhaps other options or longer options. Um, and, yeah, I, I still think we, we should keep it general rather than, you know, making it... I mean, they could look at it and think, oh, God, I've only got 12 months to pay it, and it could be just as bad. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've got to keep it very general and... and and make sure that they know that there are perhaps options, but they need to speak to us to discuss them. It, it doesn't pin us down to anything. Um, yeah, just in response to these councillor summers, um, so we do have that that sort of general uh, advice on the invoice, but it is something that Nay brought it up as well. We would add to the cover, like I would add to the covering letter from myself as well, and keeping it as general as possible. That if people are worried, that they can get in touch and they can engage and, and encouraging that early engagement. I'd absolutely agree with what you're saying there. Thanks for that. Um, if that's, um, I'm okay with that. If that's your position, um, I think I would just suggest that certainly if there's any talk about 28 days payment, very quickly, straight away, at the very least, we talk about the potential for if you're struggling, there are uh, there are things that you can do in terms of contact. Um, it shouldn't talk about anything else like. A blooming savings account or whatever <laughs> goes straight to the advice um it goes straight to the potential resources that the leaseholder can undertake in order to alleviate the situation i'm okay with that if that's what um you're you're suggesting happens are you okay with that as well and we'll leave that be as it as it is okay uh, any other comments or uh, questions on that recommendation no okay so where are we <laughs> so number seven cabinet approves the responses to matters referred to cabinet as set out in the table below um, I'm, I'm fairly neutral on there it's pretty much what was in the report before um, it is what it is what we said is what we said um, any comments and questions on that no uh, eight recommendation eight which is the last one Cabinet approves taking a test case through the first tier tribunal uh, to test the assumptions in relation to the component renewal. This will be subject to uh, identifying one or more leaseholders who are willing to pass the test participate in such a test case as is likely to take place once full engagement mechanisms are in place for leaseholders. Um, any questions or comments on that one? 
Uh, I've got no concerns. I'm happy that it's been revised um, to seeking the permission of leaseholders before going ahead, which is what was not on there before. So um, it's great to see um, scrutiny working. Um, it's worked in, on that occasion. And as you stood up at full council, you confirmed that as well, um, the portfolio holder. Okay. Um, I think we don't really need to go back over those recommendations. We've got the... Um, because we're not the executive in this, it's going to cabinet in a way, but we have got the recommendations which we've produced, moved and seconded and voted on. So I believe there was three. I, I got two. I got the, the one that you that I need two. to have a copy of around, um, around the remedial works. Okay. I've got the review and revise the payment plan criteria, including the payment amendment. Yeah, yeah. I haven't got another one. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> You've reminded me. Yeah. Um, is everybody okay with those and everything else? Any more comments or questions in, re in, uh, in relation to this agenda item on the leaseholder update? Are we all good? Okay. Right. Um, let's, are we okay to take a break before so we go to the next one? Then we can get Councillor yeah. Bradley. Yeah, we'll take five to ten minutes break um, before we move on to the next agenda item. But thank you, everyone. Can I yeah. suggest we, we, if we, we may as well, um, it is exclusion next, yeah. isn't yes. it? Yes. So can, can we may as well get that done? Because oh, the vote the on video exclusion. Then. Yeah, okay, yeah. Can I just run and get Councillor Yeah. Right, okay, so um, there's a couple of agenda items actually before the exemption. Um, working group updates, uh, there's no working group, uh, that was agenda item eight. Number nine, forward plan, to review the forward plan. Um, if anyone's got any suggestions, if anyone's looked at the forward plan, um, speak now, uh, but as ever, you can always contact me outside the committee uh, an email if there's anything on there pertinent that you wish to raise um, and that goes for anything else really um, I have said um, uh, to demo that I believe uh, one item on there which is the tenancy management policy um, I would suggest is on the agenda for the next meeting um, on the 19th of November uh, which again before it's considered for cabinet on the 21st of November um, so we have that item and um, the quarterly, quarterly performance review. for the next one, as it stands. Um, if there's anything else in the meantime, we've got a bit of time. There's five weeks until the next one, so we've got a week or so. Um, if anyone's got any ideas um, or anything, uh, please get in contact or raise it now. Okay, moving to the next one. Um, so, yeah, we've covered it. <laughs> that was 10 as well. <laughs> Mer all merged in. Um, so yeah, we move on to agenda item 11, which is the exclusion of the press and public. Um, and this is to consider excluding the press and public from the meeting by passing the following resolution. That in accordance with the provisions of the local authorities, executive arrangements, meetings and access to information, England, regulations 2012 and section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of schedule 12A to the act and the public interest in withholding the information 
outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information to the public. Um, would somebody like to move that? Moved. Councillor Summers, second. Councillor Couchman. All in favour? Thank you. That's, um, that's carried.